I think I figured, it, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't let me know that you're asking permission. <laughs> but we've got recording up in the top left corner now. Too, now it's, so. now it's going. Okay. Now it's recording. Okay. Now Paul say everything you just said over again. Right. Let's, <laughs> let's rewind it all the way back to the first question and start again. Yeah. Well, so, I mean, we were at, um, earthlings. We are all earthlings. Uh, taking our cues from the world we did not create, from the earth, uh, which as it happens created us, uh, but, but taking our bearings from there and not from um, uh, an order of things that has become um, totally toxic uh, and insane. Mm -hmm. And I think at this point, I would like to at least open a space for Nightingale, if she has something she wants to say based on that last thread. Um, and if not, that's fine, Nightingale. Um, just want to make sure that you feel comfortable chiming in here since you joined us late. Well, uh, I think I, I really, I don't have very much to say or uh, mm -hmm. what I would just do is to add to uh, sorry we have no uh, a cool house so um, what I would just like to to say is I really agree with what Paul said about us being earthlings and to know that really whatever we do. So the way, the way I see it and the way I believe is that if we let everything go, just like we have been forced to let quite a lot go by this COVID-19, we would still be able to survive. I can give an example of, uh, I had gone to Illinois and uh, Mary, Nathan and I went to Illinois, Mary and the kids were left in the house and they ran out of toilet paper and they were able to figure it out. So we, we I grew up at some point uh, in Kenya, I did use some leaves for, I, I apologize if, if I bother somebody, but I did, we did, we knew how to use leaves uh, for bathroom uses. And then all of a sudden, toilet paper became part of our system and we didn't know how to use, to do anything else, but you know, that. And then we ran out of toilet paper and then our children, who had not used leaves actually learned to use them. So um, <laughs> as earthlings, we really can cohabit with uh, the rest of the species that we've been put on this earth or in this space together. And so the main thing is to walk in full awareness that we're not the dominant ones and that we're just part of everything else. I think that's what I can say. Thank you, Nightingale. That was beautiful. And I just wanted to follow up on that. Um, two things. First of all, yeah, this this disruption of uh, people in the industrial growth society, and you know, who are caught up in this culture. Um, is an incredible opportunity because it's showing us, oh yeah, we can figure our way to do something else. And specifically when it comes to um, uh, toilet hygiene, there are cultural examples from all over the world of strategies that do not involve toilet paper. Um, and uh, in Southeast Asia, at least in the places I was, Toilet paper and leaves, neither of those were important. You had some water and you were careful about it and you washed your hands well afterward. Um, and then there's a whole tradition of, and then you don't use your left hand for anything but that, um, uh, which is a disadvantage for left-handed people. Um, <laughs> but, but that's, um, you know, that's an option. And I have to say we've been, we've been rationing here. So at least when it's easier to do, we switched to that mode because we're starting to run low and yeah, having having trouble finding it in stores. There's, there's also, you know, my kids, I hung on to 
cloth diapers just when things were going over to plastics and uh cloth works cloth can be washed and rewashed and reused for a great many different things what to do with the old rags and the missing single sock mm -hmm. you know i i was puzzled at first when toilet paper became the thing that everybody ran out to buy when they knew <laughs> they weren't going to be going to work and somebody explained to me it's because so many people were were budgeted to use the toilet paper at work they didn't have enough at home to be home 24 7 and so that's why everybody had to run by it because they no longer had access to what they were to, to the stock that they were using kind of makes sense but it's it's just as funny as it can be really that oh I, I can't have toilet paper at work anymore i need to go buy some oh my goodness Un unemployment check and a package of toilet paper. A package paper. of toilet paper. <laughs> um, I also, just <laughs> to carry this just briefly a little further, uh, read an article that as this, as the seriousness of the virus entered the communal consciousness, people felt a real loss of control. And so they latched on to what they felt they still had some sense of control over. And right. for some reason, toilet paper was it. Well, hopefully if they find a cure, we can start toilet papering houses in celebration. That would be kind of <laughs> nice, I think. <laughs> um, well, so we still have a little bit of time. Uh, does anybody else have something they want to contribute to this discussion? I, I would love to, I'd love to keep uh, following through on what Paul was saying. If we're Absolutely. taking, if we're not, not necessarily me, other people, I don't know that I have to add, but taking our cues from the earth, what might that, what's that next layer of, of birthing that comes through your mind? Mm. I wanted to mention one other book. Um, I'll try to figure out how to inc find chat. Um, maybe I'll just use my laptop after this. But another book that keeps coming to mind is entitled The Sparrow by Mary Doria oh, yeah. Russell. And I think of everything I've ever read, that book has really haunted me. And not necessarily in a good way. Um, but it really showed what happens. Um, I, well, I don't need to say more. If you're curious, look it up. Okay. I just, um, I put earlier in Elman Service, Origins of the State and Civilization, for me, it was written in the 1970s. I found it by accident in a used bookstore, and I was quite blown away by it, and I've referenced it now for years. It's a very cogent, he's an anthropologist, historian. Um, it's a very cogent explanation of how what uh, Michelle calls old growth peoples, I love that term, how old growth peoples, what are the dynamics that tend to change over time? that keep driving uh, cultures towards um, becoming more hierarchical and then more oriented to conquest and then dealing with all of the fallout that comes from that and eventually lands us where we are today. And it's not an entirely negative story because there's a lot of, there are trade-offs, there are gains that occur with these things as well. Uh, but it's it's simply elegantly told, and he bases it on very substantial understanding of actual peoples and histories. Um, it's not the the mere to me. I come it comes across as not the merely speculative account, but it's readable. It's not that long a book, and it provides kind of a larger context if we're going to um, comprehend. This is not directly relevant, but I want to put it in there. As I try to understand the world in a way that we can both 
build on what we have actually gained over these millennia and picking up on what Stuart Kaufman calls the adjacent possible, that in evolution, as we evolve, we create new opportunities and therefore new futures that we couldn't even have imagined before. And we're living that right now. So we can be informed by where we've been in the past, but also pulled forward into new potentials of uh, the ideal of universal brotherhood is literally a do or die proposition at this point. It's no longer merely a Christmas card wish. And for me, I like to focus on emerging solutions around the world because not only do they give us hope and direction and make realistic source of design and also emergence and response to emergence, but when you see a solution that really excites you, and I cannot recommend enough to look at Taiwan, I'll try to send you some more stuff on it, but it's just mind blowingly exciting what is going on there. And it actually makes the very best of algorithms and technology to create true democracy that is very grassroots. It's, it's quite an exciting combination of things. But when we see solutions that excite us, and then we reverse engineer the solution, we discover understandings of the problem that we didn't have before. So it's not in denial of the problem. It's a different way of coming at understanding what must change by looking at what actually can change that produces miraculous outcomes of the sort that you say, aha, this, this is the world we could be living in. It's real. The world we want to live in and now work backwards. What was it they did? What did they actually change that opened up this possibility? Very good, thank you, Nancy. So should we do another, just kind of a, we're, we're approaching time, but if we wanted to give ourselves a little bit of space and have um, more like a two and a half or three minutes for each person to just kind of close out and say, um, what's what's up for them now? I think now is a good time to start doing that. Um, so I can set up to structure that if someone else can go first. Uh, I'll go oh, first. Okay. Go ahead, Paul. Um, so I don't know if you're all on Facebook. Um, I have a kind of uh, prolific uh, Facebook habit. Uh, so my page has uh, pretty much everything I've read that I thought was important, um, you know, recently. Uh, but there's a, a video there uh, by a wonderful woman named Hindu Ibrahim. Um, and she talks about the knowledge of her uh, people. They are nomadic pastoral people. Uh, and her example was, you know, her grandmother being able to say not just what the weather would be like that day, but whether, you know, it would be a good, they would have a good rainfall, whether there would be a good harvest. Um, and she gave an example of uh, scientists coming, um, you know, <clears throat> um, with uh, some interest in, in what she claimed was important knowledge that they lacked. And so they're there and uh, one of the, her people says, you know, it's gonna rain now. So they start packing up and there's not a cloud in the sky. So the scientists are just sort of, you know, amused. Um, and so they get, get all their stuff packed up and then sure enough, it starts to rain um, heavily and the scientists say, well, now how could you possibly have known? And, and they point out that the insects um, take their eggs uh, into their sort of uh, 
um, you know, safe places uh, when, when it's going to rain uh, because they don't have the weather channel. Uh, they had to learn to be alert. Um, but it's a wonderful story. It's a wonderful video. Uh, you can find it on my Facebook page. And my Facebook page is P-A-U-L-S-C-H-A. Uh, so facebook.com slash P-A-U-L-S-C-H-A. Um, I post a, quite a bit, so you might have to scroll down a little to find it. Anyhow, uh, the one thing I think is we need to be mindful of the, the counter to what I think. I think this discussion, admittedly, I've contributed a bit, but I think it's on track. Uh, I, but the, you know, the counter is always that there's some sort of freedom uh, that, that we're enjoying uh, that we would lose if, if we were to acknowledge our interdependence, if we were to make the earth beneath our feet our common ground. Um, there's a poignant example of this. In the presidential primaries, Joe Biden routinely and Pete and other uh, more conservative Democrats have said, that employer health plans represent freedom and that Medicare for all is tyrannical because it would take our freedom away. Well, half the people on those plans go without medical care because they can't afford the soaring out of pocket costs. So what that thing that they're calling freedom actually means is that people do not feel free even to go to the doctor which is like gasoline on the fire of a pandemic. Um, so I think it's good to try to be alert to things like that, examples where we can kind of show, look, you know, the reality is interdependence and look what happens when we don't acknowledge it. Um, look at this false thing that is not freedom, uh, pretending to be freedom. I want to just tag off of what Paul said there. I saw a statistic that out of the 10 million people that have gone on unemployment in the last two weeks, over 3 million of them lost their health insurance. That was what the story said. Now, if you flip that on its head, that means 7 million who went on unemployment didn't have health insurance from the employer. And that gives you a clue as to who went on unemployment, which is the people that are working for minimum wage and don't work at a company that gives health insurance. Okay, so yeah, there's there's that piece. And your story, Paul, also reminded me of, of something I, I heard a long time ago, and this goes back maybe 15 years. There was a forest fire in, and it was a South American country. I don't recall quite which one it was, it was in the, the northern part of the continent. And they hadn't had rain for months, and somebody pointed them to a particular tribe who had some rain-making shamans, and so the government at one point, no rain in the forecast, just threw up their hands and said, okay, if we bring these two rain-making shamans to the town, to the city, put them up for a couple of days in a hotel, feed them, and, and maybe give them a little bit of coin, would they come in and, and do rain-making? So they went off and did that, and these two shamans show up, and and they disappear for about three hours, and then they come back into town, and they go to their hotel room, and they have a good night, a good time, you know, living in the city kind of a thing. And at midnight, it started to rain. And it rained so hard that by two days later, they had no more fire. The fire was completely put out by the rain. And so somebody asked the, the shamans, well, how did you do that? What did you do? And they said, we didn't do anything. We just went down and, and expressed our gratitude for water. And we knew from reading the signs, it was going to rain. We didn't make the rain. We knew it was coming. And so, yeah, the intimate knowledge of the land. I mean, that is that is so critical. And we have so lost that. I mean, that's the whole point behind Nova Sutras. Maybe not the whole point, but a big point behind Nova Sutras is let's get back in contact with nature. And as a culture, we have built so many walls 
to condition the air, either hotter or colder, to separate us from, give us privacy, to, you know, whatever it happens to be. And so a key point, a key takeaway from this discussion today is how do we get more intimate with our, with the land beneath our feet? That's where we're supported. That's where our food comes from. That's where our energy comes from. Let's, uh, let's get more in touch with that and, and start to build up our own intimate knowledge of the area in which we live. The other thing I wonder about that example is uh, the synchronicity of people deciding, well, let's bring the shaman. Everything, it sort of approaches a timing that if people were allowed to be more sensitive about what's really going on, what they actually feel, and the sensation of living, uh, we were going to be a lot more connected. And I mean, it's possible to do now if you can cut out some of the noise. Uh, I also want to comment on two other things that somebody said. Uh, one, you want a longer day? I, I always thought 40 hours would be good with two sleep cycles. One long enough to at least have dreams and the other one just to rest up. And uh, if the talking about living with animals and I keep thinking that I always picture a rewilding and in the rewilding, you're going to have big cats and bears. I always have the, the thought always interests me about uh, that I do respect all life, but it's kind of frightening, but uh, people are more frightening, but uh, I do, I do think that's, that's the way it's got to be. It's got to be local, a certain amount of local independence, which is what you're talking about, having a connection to the community. I'm also a little wary just as a, a a modern person about that too. I have my own tiny misgivings about, I think a lot of people in the 60s experienced, I need to get out of this town. I need to go somewhere else. So there's always that sense of restlessness I have, but I, I think a lot of that's just kind of neurotic. And uh, I think that scene I picture, how do you know, th seeing things is better, is takes care of a, a great deal of that, but you have to start experiencing it. That's all. Anyone uh, want to jump in next? I guess um, I will go. And uh, I have two things. I just wanted to say, uh, to tag on to what Rob said about him having this neurotic feeling to want to, to move around. And I feel like if we dig a little bit deeper, we might find all of ourselves. And, you know, we have some of that because like recently, I remember Paul said, shared that he actually, um, I think it was Paul, yeah, that you moved your table around so that you, and now you're really happy with the, with uh, your, the current spot that your table is at and what you're seeing, which is good. Uh, but I'm curious to, to hear down the line, if you might do that change again in another few months or maybe in about a year. And so just wondering if right now we don't have as much control, we cannot uh, migrate or be as nomadic as we could have been years back. So what we do is we move around things and it, it makes us feel like we have actually moved from one place to the other, but we're still in one spot, which I know I, I love to do that actually. Uh, after a while I get tired of how my house is and I, just want to move things around and I really love that. So just wanted to share that. But I also wanted to jump onto the issue of um, guilt that, that seems to be there in a lot of us, anger in a lot of us, and especially like when I look at colonialism or when we look at the, the land that was taken by people from others. And in a lot of ways, I, it's hard to reverse some of that because some of, so many of us have moved around such that we do not have a place to go back to where we came from. And so just looking for a common sacred spot where we can all heal together instead of 
people perpetually living in guilt. I mean, it's good to have that guilt. And like, we do have the white guilt that I have many questions about when it comes to whites and, and uh, you know, the so-called whites and, and the so-called brown people. Uh, so just to look for a place where we can all start to heal and hopefully this guilt can go die down and the anger can die down and we can all be more together than apart, blaming and, and you know, stuff like that. So that's something I would love to talk about more. Yeah, I would love that to be a topic for a whole session. That would be beautiful. Thank you for bringing that Nightingale. Uh, <sighs> yeah. And resonating with what you said also, Nightingale, about moving around within our own space for whatever reason, I like to operate out of my my toiletry bag. I don't like to take the stuff out and put it on the counter. And uh, it kind of drives my mom crazy. She's like, you're not going anywhere. You can put your toiletry bag away. I'm like, I just like it here. It makes me feel like I'm on the move or something. I don't know. It's But to, to hear you say that, I just had to laugh at, at the ways that I do that. Um, so thank you for that. And I guess I'm just right back into the, the deep heart uh, feeling of really wanting to have a session that maybe you lead or however to, to deal with that white versus brown story that has just been never discussed in, you know, in, in the circles that I've been in and yet I've felt it so much. So thank you and I, I look forward to crying with you on that. Thank you, Peter. Hopefully we can do that sometime. Um, well, I can, I can step in. One of the other things that I'm supposed to be dedicating a lot of time to right now is that I'm in uh, training for facilitators of the work that reconnects. And a big piece of that right now is uh, dealing with those very questions. Um, there, there's a whole series of books about um, inclusion and uh, kind of coping with uh, white guilt, white privilege, white fragility as being all kind of of a piece of this same system of oppression. Um, and how, how we navigate that and how we help to uh, turn the corner on that. And I am a complete beginner. Uh, this is, that's the part that I feel like I need to learn the most about. Um, so I'm so grateful to be uh, in a system that's, that's very actively investigating that and supporting that. And that's, that's my learning edge right now, uh, is working, working on that a lot more. Um, so I wanted to, to yeah, just uh, join, join the bandwagon of we got to work on this stuff. Um, this, is, this is really important and this is an important piece of how we get to that better and what that better is going to look like. Um, other pieces of it and something else that I can offer, uh, there's a, a talk that I gave several years ago about uh, real rewilding and permaculture and our own internal ecosystems and looking at all of those from from a place of um, respectful participation in tending complex ecosystems and that's uh, that's a big part of my vision of what does better look like is that we become um, co-creators and participants in a lot of the story of life and how to do that really well. Uh, and I think finding our way to that is going to require us to use all of the best tools that we currently have um, around the science of these different uh, complex living adaptive systems. Uh, but also really tapping into uh, 
traditional ecological knowledge trapping it, tapping into the people who still hold that kind of uh, wisdom and connection with place. Um, so that's a, a lot of a lot of work that I want to be doing right now is around that. So I've just attached your name to that as being a deep dive topic that we will get to here shortly. <laughs> there we go. A few more to go. Oops. <laughs> um. I really appreciate everything we've been saying and look forward to those topics. I'm thinking if um, in particular, picking up partly on the African story that we were focusing on a few days ago and these issues and returning to the earth. One of the things I've been challenged by over the many years is cultural relativism, which is this real two-edged sword and what I love about seeing ourselves as earthlings, one species shared with our natural character, the characteristics of our own DNA that is shared with all of us and our relationship to the earth as it, it provides a source of ethics that is not culturally specific. And in my discipline, my field, it was philosophy. Uh, we were always cautioned against something called the naturalistic fallacy, which I won't go into right now, but it might be worth a little time sometime. But over the decades now, as, I, as the work I've done keeps going back to kind of applied philosophy in the real world, I keep coming, well, we need some fundamental, the, the design specs, the system requirements that get at it. Well, it seems to be nature. What? fosters health and well-being for all affected by the decisions we're making. That seems really very basic and very absolute. It's relative to the given ecologies and situations, but the underlying core is there. And the last thing I want to note is, if we can have that, I would love to have Leanne Nurse back. Um, she and I have been talking about these things for years, and also both Stanley and um, Ernestina, we've had many conversations in particular about their, their grandmothers and their great grandmothers and their connection both to the relationship to the land that was peculiar to their particular place and the knowledge that they are, that is just barely still there to hold to pull back in and really invest in, in that and the knowledge of relationship, how to relate to each other. So these diff seemingly differing topics are actually naturally all connected. So I look forward to these deep dives. Thank you, Nancy. And let me just offer, if you were able to work with Leanne and come up with a day and a time that works for her to do that deep dive and, and lead that, let us know. We'll definitely schedule it that particular day and time for this meeting. So, Would you like me to include Stanley and Ernestina? If possible, absolutely. Well. Okay. Yes. And perhaps, Paul, um, keep for not getting the name. My old memory doesn't. Oh, sorry. Thank you, yes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so that would make it uh, probably a morning, a morning session, right, for Casara? That's right. Yeah, morning session. So Francesca, be careful what you say here. We're signing people up for deep dives based on what they say. Be very careful. I don't really have anything to add right now. <laughs> okay. That might be too careful. Fine. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I'm to wrap this up for today, unfortunately. God, I okay, love this. And, I love this. Um, I just, just to follow up on our conversation here, I want to actually do the, uh, the screen share because this is something that uh, we seem to be uh, working around a little bit is what, you know, what are these underlying principles? What can we, what mm -hmm. can we tap into? What can we learn from nature? Um, and this is just, this is a framework that, 
that I came up with and I'm willing to play with it. But I think uh, some of these essentials that, uh, that we can say these are, these are principles that can guide us, that can be universal, um, that come from looking at uh, the entire world, not just human constructed world. Um, Fantastic. So I just wanted to offer that as mm -hmm. again, um, you know, maybe this is something that we we take a little time with and do some deeper discussions around as well. Thank you so much for that. Um, so once again, uh, this has been just an amazing, amazing discussion. And thank you, Nancy, for pushing us in to start recording because you're right, we, we lost a lot today. We, we might want to reflect back on. I um, want to express my gratitude for everyone, for your presence, your energy, your thoughts, your heart, uh, and being willing to share that. And as we end up here, I want to go around and just hear one word a joyful word um, that helps describe how you feel coming out of today's session. And I just have to say, grateful. I will say moved. Relieved. Inspired. Comforted. Oh. Comforted. Connected. Mm. Mary stole mine and we didn't talk about it. Gratitude. Mm -hmm. Inspired, definitely. And so let's all hold hands and look at these various faces, people that I've come to love in just a short time. We haven't even been doing this a week and oh my God, yeah. totally amazing. amazing. Are the times out for next week? Was that part of the email, Michelle? Yeah. Yeah. And I'll, oh, actually, I'll I have a question. One. We seem to be scheduled for two times tomorrow. Is so, that correct? Uh, that's great segue. I was just going to say yeah. about tomorrow. So my concern was that we weren't going to have enough sessions that people could attend. We don't have to do two tomorrow, but we put out the word. So I will be on two times tomorrow yeah. and the person that I consider my guru in economics put out a podcast uh, last night that is it has a lot to um, a lot to point to in our current economic situation the coming depression and I felt that there was about 10 minutes worth of share that I wanted to do on that um, talking with Michelle about that, she suggested that maybe we choose one of the two sessions tomorrow, either 9.30 or 6, and have that be the topic for that talk, or for that meeting. And so is there some sense, I mean, first of all, does that sound like a, a useful use of time? And then second of all, which one would you prefer that be, the 9.30 or the 6? Personally, I would prefer the six because um, I would have to leave early because of Quaker meeting okay. and some other meetings uh, that extend into the day. Me too. Does six not work for someone that would be interested in that? Okay, so we'll plan on doing that at six o'clock piece tomorrow. Right. Okay. So nine thirty. Probably we'll just have the nine thirty as a more just a, a like drop we have and go around. Derek, yeah. would you yes, be ma willing, meanwhile, to share the name or the link to the podcast? Yes. Um, that is easily done because I, the original plan was I was going to try to go into that as part of our hang around afterwards. And so the name is Chris Martinson. The website is Peak Prosperity. And the actual video from last night is right here. Now understand Chris has been doing a daily podcast on the coronavirus since late January. Okay. Um, I was in Thailand when this whole thing blew up in China. And those of us that were following Asian news feeds 
uh, understood in January this was turning into a this would turn into a pandemic when a nation like China is willing to shut down first 15 million and then 60 million people one of their economic powerhouses and they were willing to lock them down when you look at what governments do not what they say when the, what they do is something like that you know this is going to be bad and so he picked up on that he's been talking about it that's i'm going to recap some of that tomorrow and yeah so he's been on top of this his phd is virology okay so mm -hmm. he like you know understands how this is it would all work out and, and turn out so but again he's been my economic guru so we're going to focus more on the eco on the economy piece in here um but yeah so that's the that's the uh, url for the one last night i made it a tiny url because that's so much easier to type into a text message and so there we go thank you any last words before we wrap this up and and get out there and start doing some good things to help get us through this crisis. Um, I would, I would like to share that I felt so moved that there, I just got knocked off for a second, but in the meantime, I sent a Facebook message to the three African American boys that I grew up with. There were three in the whole city and just sent them a group message saying, I'd love to connect and I'm starting to do some more work on this. And so I'm, I'm moved. Thank you. Fantastic. All. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. I would love to talk to Nancy and Nightingale as soon as the two of you have time about uh, possible presentations for future groups. Okay, maybe we can do that uh, after this if Nancy is, if you both are available. That'd be great. Give okay. me about 20 minutes. Okay. Okay. Break, okay, and then I would love to do that. Okay, and uh, I also wanted to add that Mary is here still, mm -hmm. uh, but she she asked to have a break from talking today, mm -hmm. but she's yeah. been she's been there. And she's still one of us. We 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 felt that throughout the uh, throughout the time you've been on. Yes, we knew that. Thank you so much. Any other last words? Now, when you have this connection, Nancy and Nightingale and Paul in 20 minutes, are you wanting to use this platform or do you have another platform you can use or? I have just um, gotten, finally gotten the pro. Okay. I think I'll experiment with hosting it. It's a, a kind of low, low stakes opportunity to do it. And if I run into problems, I'll get back to. Okay. To um, one of you for help, but uh, and if you we here, can let also me, just do a three-way phone call if need be. If we can't make the Zoom work, I, I definitely know how to do three-way phone calls. <laughs> okay. Alrighty. Okay. Thank you. Thank everyone so so much. Namaste. Deeply grateful to to have found y'all. Thank you so much. All right. Bye bye, everybody. Be well. Bye.